Hello, and welcome to NCT On Air. It's Emily Kirkpatrick, NCT's new Executive Director, and I'm thrilled to be with you uh, talking about a topic that's near and dear to my heart with educators who have also um, been a part of my life over the last several years. Uh, for two decades, my work has focused on literacy with a particular focus on innovation, building products and tools uh, that most respond to the hearts and the minds of students um, across the country and throughout this world. Um, I'm particularly passionate about 21st century learning um, and uh, those uh, interest areas overlap with the four educators joining us tonight. We have Frankie Siberson and Bill Bass, who are the co-authors of Digital Reading, What's Essential in Grades 3 through 8. We also have Kristen Hawley-Turner and Troy Hicks, who are the co-authors of Connected Reading, Teaching Adolescent Readers in a Digital World. Let's move to our guest and now have each of you tell us briefly what you do in your day jobs when you're not writing books or hanging out with NCTE. Frankie, would you like to I go? I can go first. My name is Bill Bass. Okay, okay am I going first now? I'm Frankie Siberson. Um, I teach third grade in Dublin, Ohio. Um, that, that's right outside of Columbus. Bill? My name is Bill Bass. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, and I serve the Parkway School District as a an innovation coordinator, and I work with teachers around using technology in the classroom and um, literacy, and then I run our library program as well. Troy? I'm Troy Hicks. I'm a professor of English at Central Michigan University, where I also direct our Chippewa River Writing Project. And Kristen. Hi, I'm Kristen Turner, and I am an associate professor in the Fordham Graduate School of Education, and I also direct the Fordham Digital Literacies Collaborative. So now you've been introduced to our distinguished panel. As you can see, it's a wonderful group joining us. Let's jump right into the questions. When people talk about digi digital learning and refer to digital learning as a topic, What's the one thing you wish they most understood about the term and about the practice? We'll start with Troy. Thanks. So the one thing that um, I uh, would like for all of us to keep in mind um, actually comes from uh, Doug Belshaw, who has talked about a number of uh, elements related to digital literacy. I'm trying to remember the number. I should. It's the eight essential elements of digital literacy. Um, he has TED Talks and a great blog and does a lot of work um, on Twitter and through social media as well. At any rate, what Doug uh, reminds us is that um, it's not just about uh, elegant consumption, um, having you know tools and devices that look like this where we can easily stream and download, um, but it's also about content creation and enabling students to do the critical and creative types of work. So I like that phrase that uh, he uses, elegant consumption, and that we have to move beyond elegant consumption when we're thinking about digital learning. It's not just enough to get a kid to log into a website or to have a particular app. Um, it's the fact that they actually have the tools in their pocket to be a digital reader and a digital writer. And I think that that's uh, one of my key messages throughout my work and the work that I've done with um, our colleagues here tonight and something that I hope all of us would carry with us into Digital Learning Day this year. Great. What about you, Frankie? Um, I think that um, what it really means for me and what I think I've learned is that it's really not an either-or conversation, that digital literacy is really about an expanded definition of literacy for our kids. I teach third grade. So even though my workshop looks the same, the options my kids have, there's so many more. Um, the way they read, what they read on, how they respond, um, how they connect um, text and how they connect to other readers. I just think um, all of the digital tools have just expanded what's possible in literacy. And so, so for me, that's really helped me 
just add to what I do. It just adds to the possibilities for kids and, and weighs in for kids instead of replacing anything. And Bill. So I think one of the one of the pieces that goes along here is that really what when, when we talk about digital learning and um, and digital literacy, the the authenticity is crucial. It's something that we we have to have. We have to give kids authentic learning experiences and 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 students of all ages those authentic learning experiences. So it's not something that they only do when they're sitting in front of us. I think lots of times we can cajole and we can. Um, you know, creatively entice kids to do the things that we want them to do. But if we're really going to push push our learning and, and, and give them experiences that are going to matter to them on an ongoing basis, it has to be authentic. And we have to give them real world experiences um, in order to make that happen. I absolutely b believe in uh, the core propositions that you've shared, authenticity and the fact that it isn't an either or. Um, what, what's your biggest takeaway or what has most spoken to you in all of your research linking uh, digital learning and literacy? Bill? So I think that for for many many years now, I'm I'm a former um, classroom English teacher, and I I spent many many years uh, trying to convince my kids to um, to consume less and and really create more. And we used to think of I used to think of consumption as being a passive experience and creation as active. But what I've come to realize and what I've come to you know kind of think about through this is that we, in everything that they, everything that kids are creating, is influenced by something that they've consumed at some point in time. And so, if they don't have that consumption, I mean, we give we give kids opportunities with mentor text in order to create their own text. Well, the same thing the same thing holds true when we're talking about digital tools and digital digital literacy. So, if we want kids to create videos and show us their understanding and their learning through a video, then we have to give them videos to watch and we have to show them the techniques and and have those um, have those authentic experiences and intentionally create opportunities for them to consume so that in turn they can create. And Kristen, what would you add? Well, I know that Bill is working with a younger population than the group that Troy and I researched for our book, and we thought a lot about uh, the the media conversation. Is Google making us stupid? Um, the Nicholas Carr, the Shallows, and and what are the effects of the screens on kids? And at the same time, knowing that our teenagers are always reading on their phones or on their phones, we wanted to explore what are they actually doing. So I think that one of the things we learned from our research is that teens actually are very purposeful in the reading that they do, and they are not either or readers. They are not just print digital re print readers or digital readers. And um, they are not always just spending their time going down a rabbit hole, but they have very intentional choices for the kinds of reading that they do. They choose digital for particular purposes. They choose print for particular purposes. They choose uh, news magazines for particular purposes. They choose uh, online news. They read to learn, to be connected, and they're doing all of these wonderful things outside of school. And what we really need to learn how to do is capture that and help them be better readers in their out-of-school spaces in school as well. So that was my big takeaway. Fantastic. Uh, we know that among the student population uh, that we all serve that access, particularly consistent access uh, to technology is not always available. In fact, that's been a topic even in my household at a policy level today, looking at local access um, uh, to high-speed internet access. What do you say to the teacher, to the educator out there who is very interested in digital learning but has a great awareness among his or her student population um, that would have access being a concern? Is it an either-or at that point? 
um, or is there perhaps a different way uh, to look at that challenge? Kristen, could you take that one? This is such an important question and it's it's something that I know all four of us address all the time when we we talk with each other, we talk with teachers. Uh, the teachers that I work with in the Fordham Digital Literacies Collaborative all work in New York City public schools, so this is something that's very real to them and we work through these issues of access. And what we learn from the research of talking to over 800 teenagers across the country is that we first want to be sure of our reality in the classroom. Do we actually have access when we don't think we do? So most kids are carrying cell phones in their pockets now. Um, and even though those are small screens, those are still screens that allow students access to the internet. So how can we take advantage of those rather than filing those away in a box or in the desk or in the locker or even making them stay at home? Uh, so you need to talk to the kids in your classroom and find out. Don't just assume, do they have access, don't they? Because most of the students in our study actually said we do have access outside of school. It might not be the best access, but we do have some. And for those students that don't have access in our classrooms, that's where we as teachers need to start being advocates. So a lot of the teachers in the Digital Literacies Collaborative have written grants. Um, they've gone to their principals and said, I want these things in my classrooms, help me get them. And they've been very successful in the individual teacher's classroom of changing the access for their kids. So they started by saying, what do you have access with? And for those that didn't have any, they became advocates um, for getting those students access. Troy, what would you add uh, to this piece of the conversation? So one of the things that I've always appreciated about NCTE and uh, its membership is the fact that we have advocated for kids and for their literacies. And one specific way that NCTE has done that kind of work is through um, the work around censorship and helping individual teachers and departments and schools fight against censorship. And I see this conversation that we're now having about access, both access to the internet itself as well as having the devices in kids' hands. Um, equally as important for NCTE. This is our challenge in the new uh, century here. We need to think about um, where kids are encountering and engaging with text, digital and print, and in the case of digital, I think it's just as important that we take up the mantle and say we are going to try to um, provide students with this access. Um, unfortunately, the world isn't perfect. We wish that kids came prepared or that we had enough money for technology in all of our schools. We know that's not the case. But there are some spaces and some places and some ideas um, that we can use and some ways that we can advocate. And um, two things that I, I found interesting and um, personally would like to learn more about and would encourage teachers to explore too are uh, number one, the Everyone On initiative, which can help um, students from impoverished backgrounds uh, get internet access in their home at a reduced cost. Um, it's uh, somehow uh, coordinated. I don't know all the details behind it, but it is uh, coordinated through the federal government, and then they work with cable contractors like Comcast to get um, cable high-speed internet in homes. I think for a cost of about $10 a month and low-cost computers as well. So that would be one way to think about how to help encourage our students and our families get access. Um, others are through organizations like uh, Interconnection. And Interconnection is uh, a group that takes um, computers and devices and uh, recycles them and um, then is able to sell them at a very discounted rate. Now, I believe this particular group is located in Seattle, um, and so I think we would have to look for other groups um, that are located more locally for obviously other people in different parts of the country. Um, and yet again, I think we have, you know, businesses, universities that are constantly turning over computers that are in fairly decent shape, can be refurbished and 
have new software operating system updates and things like that and they could go to schools and individual children and families and they could follow a model of something like uh, Tech Goes Home which is a program that began in Boston um, and is now going uh, more national which trains both students and their parents or caregivers to use the technology in smart productive ways so I think uh, you know to go back to that initial comment about uh, being more than just elegant consumption. We want students and teachers and their parents and communities to have access and opportunity um, to create and not to just consume. And certainly, once a, a child, a, a student, or a family has access, then you know, it's incumbent upon all of us to advocate for that access then being used for the purpose of education um, and not just recreational use. Um, and that's, you know, a, a very interesting uh, continuum to discuss as well. Pulling back uh, to um, a reference Frankie made earlier this evening about digital learning not being an either or. What do you have to say, Frankie, about access? Is it an either-or equation? Either a student has it or doesn't? How do you see this? Well, I think um, working with young kids, I think part of our responsibility is to try to get the access in the classroom. I think that's, if they don't have it at home, that's their first place to get it. And just kind of building on what Kristen and Troy said, I think as we're doing all the things to get kids access, there's things we can do even if we just have our own phone in the classroom that could really expose kids and start to change the way they think about um, literacy and the experiences that they have and the opportunities. So that for a while, and Bill and I were on the executive committee when we started thinking about this on the council, and we didn't have a lot of stuff and a lot of technology and a lot of access in the classroom. And I remember thinking, I can't do this without this, 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 and this. But now, you know, I, when I changed my attitude to really think about, okay, what do I have? What can I do? Um, you know, we still had a lot of filters. We still, we were still in the new stages. But once I changed my attitude to what do I have and where, how can I kind of grow from there, um, that really helped me. So I think for teachers, it's helpful to think about what what access do you have and what can you do with what you have right now, and then how can you grow that. Thank you. This session has been truly inspiring and we thank you all for donating your time this evening after a long day and most importantly for all that you do every single day on behalf of teachers and students and literacy in your communities and across the country. For those of you watching this video, this is the tip of the iceberg. Check out our guest books and more at the bit.ly link bit.ly backslash NCTE hyphen digital hyphen lit. As NCTE moves forward, I can assure you this topic will be um, a frequent one and one with which we will be approaching with greater depth um, each month and each year again as the organization makes progress. Thank you again for joining us tonight. NCTE is grateful for all of you. Good evening.